Elix 2, like the first game, is an open-world action-adventure RPG by Piranha Bytes that blends elements of science fiction, fantasy, and post-apocalypse themes. The story continues a few years after the first game's conclusion, with a new extraterrestrial threat arriving to wreak havoc on the various factions of Magalon. You play as the same character, Jax, trying to unite the factions and find a way to stop the aliens from taking over the planet. The game spans four chapters across a relatively large map and gives you plenty of options about how to build your character, both in terms of Jax's personality as well as your playstyle and combat mechanics. The first game was somewhat notorious for its steep difficulty curve, which was compounded by having some really weird and idiosyncratic mechanics that the game didn't explain very well, while also being pretty janky and rough around the edges in general. Those factors combine to make Elix 1 a difficult game for some people to get into, but fortunately the developer has taken steps in the sequel to address many of those complaints, thus making Elix 2 a generally smoother and more accessible game to get into. It's still not the most intuitive game in the world, however, as it still has some of those weird Piranha Bytes idiosyncrasies that can make it a bit trickier to figure out, compared to other more mainstream games. If you've played the first game already, then you're reasonably well prepared to jump into the sequel without too much of a struggle, but even then, as a Piranha Bytes veteran, I still found myself wishing I'd known certain things earlier in my playthrough of Elix 2. And if for some reason you haven't played the first game, then you might be in even more need of some basic guidance to get you started. My goal with this guide is to give some basic, spoiler-free tips and strategies to help facilitate a better gameplay experience for new players, based on my experience pouring 192 hours and counting into the game across multiple playthroughs. Part of the fun of these games is exploring the world and figuring things out for yourself, so I won't be going into specific detail about where to find all the best weapons and armor, or exactly how you should be solving quests or building your character to get the best outcomes and so on, because I want to leave you that opportunity to discover that stuff on your own. But some things are difficult to figure out on your own without doing a lot of extensive testing, or else are impossible to anticipate early in your playthrough. So these are the things I think you should know early in your playthrough to help you understand the game better and to have more fun playing it. Number 1. You don't have to play Elix 1 first, but you probably should. Elix 2 is a direct sequel, so naturally the question that might arise is if you need to play the first game to understand the second one. The good news is that the story of the first game wasn't that complicated, and you don't need to know much more than the basics to understand what's going on in Elix 2, which the sequel does a decent job of catching you up on through the intro cinematics, flashbacks, dialogue, and readable notes. Most characters who return from the first game, for instance, give you the opportunity to have them refresh your memory on how you know them, just in case you never played the first game and are meeting them for the first time as a player, and you can read lots of books that explain things about the different factions' lore and backstory so you can understand them better. The game was clearly designed with the intention that new players be able to jump straight in with the sequel, so it should be pretty easy to follow along with what's happening in Elix 2 if you haven't played the first game first. So if you want to do that, it's totally feasible. With that being said, you still probably should play Elix 1 first, seeing as the sequel has a lot of recurring elements from the first game which you'll be able to appreciate more if you already have first-hand experience with them. Part of the map from the first game has been reused in the sequel, for example, but it's undergone significant changes as a result of the Berserkers terraforming, so some of the fun and exploration stems from recognizing these familiar places and seeing how they've changed over the last several years. You don't have to have played the first game to enjoy the world or exploration in the sequel, but that's one less thing to enjoy if you haven't. The factions have likewise changed pretty significantly from Elix 1, and while there's enough in-game explanation for you to understand the scope of these changes, it'll feel more dramatic and impactful to you if you've actually experienced what they were like in the first game. You'll also run into a lot of familiar characters in the sequel, many of whom are companion characters whom you've gone on extensive adventures with previously, or even romanced, and so there's an extra sense of camaraderie you'd be missing out on by skipping Elix 1. Finally, the first game has some pretty fun secrets to discover about Magalon's history, which the sequel straight up spoils, so if you were to play Elix 2 first and wind up enjoying it enough to want to go back and play the first game, then those revelations would be nowhere near as dramatic or exciting in Elix 1 since you would already know the outcomes. Number 2. Follow the main quest early on. The main quest spans four chapters, with the first chapter basically being a preliminary matter to get your home base and the Bastion up and running, and then to gather intelligence on the various factions, possibly even joining one if you so choose. 
The first chapter is intended to be a fairly open process of non-linear questing and exploration, and it's sometimes customary in these types of games to ignore the main quest initially and go off doing your own thing, but I'd recommend sticking to the main quest line for the first several steps until you finish the initial quests in the Bastion, up through preparing the Bastion, which involves clearing out the nearby critters and recruiting two NPCs. The intro nudges you towards doing this anyway, since the level design and NPC interactions guide you towards the Bastion as the first major step of the game, so you'll probably be naturally inclined to do this anyway. But you'll be returning there a lot over the course of the game, and it's helpful to have a few merchants and skill trainers set up there so you aren't having to hunt down as many NPCs spread out all over the map to fulfill your basic service needs. Plus, I just think it helps the early game momentum by giving you more concrete goals to be working towards before setting out into the open world, and it also gives you some more narrative context to establish what's going on in the world and between important characters. Number 3. Don't worry about the infection. There's no time limit. At the start of the game, Jax gets infected by an alien creature, and from then on the screen will periodically flash and Jax will comment about needing to get a move on and do something before something happens to him. This is mostly a cosmetic feature to remind you that Jax has been infected, but it won't have any impact on the gameplay or story in Chapter 1. There's no ticking clock that will cause bad things to happen if you don't get around to curing the infection soon enough. Things will eventually start happening to Jax in later chapters as part of the main questline, but it's nothing you need to worry about, as it's mostly inconsequential and you're given ways to prevent those things from happening anyway. Number 4. Join a faction sooner rather than later. Don't be afraid to join a faction relatively early in the game because you think you'll miss out on other factions' quests. Although there are many quests you can do in each faction before joining them, some of which are even official membership quests to join that faction, you can still do every other faction's quests, even the admissions quests, after already joining another faction. The faction leaders will simply offer you a different reward instead of admitting you to their faction. The only faction-exclusive quests are the ones associated with being promoted to a higher rank, which you of course can only get after joining a faction anyway, so there is absolutely no consequence and zero content to miss out on if you join one faction before doing another's quests. It's still a good idea to visit each faction and complete some of their quests before committing to one, so that you have a basic idea of each faction's ideologies before picking one, but the faction armor and abilities can be a pretty big boost early in the game and can be pretty fun in some cases. Therefore, the sooner you join a faction, the sooner you can get into enjoying all their fun benefits and having a somewhat easier time with the game's tough difficulty curve. If you wait to join a faction until you've already done everything else, then you'll just be unnecessarily handicapping yourself and missing out on the fun, unique faction stuff for the majority of the game's playtime, since the majority of content is front-loaded in Chapter 1. There are five total factions to join this time around, however two of them are basically sub-factions that you can only join after already joining one of the three primary factions. The main three ones are the Berserkers, who use fire magic like ranged fireballs, melee fire fists, and rain of fire, the Albs who use ice and electric magic like chain lightning, ice fist, and blizzard, and the Morcons, who get various boosts to melee combat like better damage, armor, movement speed, and so on, in exchange for sacrificing their health. As an Alb, you will later have the option to join the Clerics, whereas the Berserkers and Morcons will have the chance to join the Outlaws by way of the Claws and Crichtonites, respectively. The Claws being the Thieves' Guild from the first game, who have a base of operations in the Berserkers' headquarters, and the Crichtonites being a group of Morcons who don't support the destructive violence of the Morcon dogmas. In each case, they'll want you to act as sort of a double agent for your primary faction, so you'll retain all your faction skills and access to all faction services, but you'll wind up joining a sub-faction instead of being promoted to the highest rank of your primary faction. This basically just means you won't get your primary faction's best armor set, but you'll be compensated with a few extra skills by joining a sub-faction, who will also give you comparable armor anyway, so it's kind of just a personal choice what you want to do. Note that you can start each faction and sub-faction's quests independently and play both sides up until a certain point, but there will come a point of no return during each primary faction's second promotion quest to achieve their highest rank where you'll have to make a choice. The game is usually pretty explicit about when you'll be locked out of pursuing either option, so just pay attention and it should be pretty easy to tell. I should also mention that, in an unusual twist for a Piranha Bytes game, you don't have to join a faction in Elix 2. However, I don't recommend going that route, at least not for a first playthrough, because you don't get any sort of special skills to make the gameplay more fun or interesting. 
If anything, it's really more of a challenge mode to complete the game without any faction skills, so it's something I'd only recommend after already finishing the game if you want the achievement or just want that extra challenge. Number 5. Make upgrading the jetpack an early priority. The jetpack has a lot of new abilities in Elix 2, which can make the game a lot easier and also a lot more fun, so I would recommend unlocking its full potential early in the game so you can have more fun earlier and more time to benefit from it. The sprint boosters allow you to quickly fly across the landscape like an alternative form of fast travel, which can be a lot of fun in and of itself while also cutting down on time running across the map, but it can also come in handy in combat situations, allowing you to get out of a difficult situation or jump back into a fight more quickly. Then you've got the floating ability that allows you to use your weapons, even your sword, in mid-air, which doubles as your basic jetpack attack similar to the first game, except it works from a greater distance and greater variety of angles, plus the dodge ability to avoid enemy attacks. Upgrading your fuel capacity will allow you to use it longer before waiting for it to recharge, although you need to spend fuel canisters for each upgrade. It costs just one skill point to learn how to increase your fuel capacity, and then it's free to install fuel canisters afterward anytime you acquire one. The retro rockets are less useful in my opinion. Their purpose is to prevent you from taking fatal fall damage, but I found that to be a pretty rare occurrence that I was usually able to control on my own, but it could be worth it if you find yourself misjudging your jetpack usage frequently enough. Number 6. You don't have to buy jetpack fuel. I wondered early in my playthrough if there was going to be exactly 50 fuel canisters in the world, since you can only upgrade it 50 times, like if it was going to be some kind of rare collectible achievement, but it turns out there are actually a lot more than 50 canisters to find in the world. In my case, I bought a few fuel containers from merchants in odd locations because I didn't want to have to remember to come back to them later if it became necessary, but I later discovered that there are more than enough canisters to find for free through exploration that you don't have to buy any to max out the jetpack's fuel capacity. Buying them will help you reach the maximum capacity earlier, of course, so it's something you may still consider doing, but I would only recommend that later in the game when it won't be such a huge hit to your wallet to spend 500 or a few thousand Alexit on fuel. And if you want to save money and not buy any at all, just be aware that's an option too. Number 7. Get a companion as soon as possible. The difficulty curve in Elix 2 isn't as extreme as it was in the first game, but it can still be pretty tough fighting enemies at the very start of the game before you've had a chance to invest significant upgrades in your abilities or equipment. That's where a companion can come in handy, since they can effectively dish out and tank more damage than you're capable of early on, and it can also help simply having someone around to distract enemies. Kaya is the first companion you'll come across along the main path from the starting area, and she can be recruited to follow you once you complete two quests to bring Dex to the Bastion and to kill a nearby group of Morcons, both of which are pretty easy and straightforward tasks, especially if you notice those conveniently placed red barrels by the Morcons. You can also find Crony, your combat drone, not too far from the starting area, by a roadside billboard west of the starting point. There's no quest required to get him to join you, and he's pretty easy to reach, too. These two are arguably the best combat companions because they use ranged attacks by default. Kaya even has an extra burning effect for damage over time, which means they'll be more active attacking enemies and thus more likely to engage them, whereas the other companions who default to melee weapons tend to get stuck standing around not really doing anything. Number 8. Use kicks, parries, and special attacks in melee combat. The melee combat system has a lot of tricks up its sleeve that the game doesn't necessarily tell you about, or if it does, it's not necessarily in an effective way. Besides just your basic light and heavy attacks, you can also perform sprinting attacks, backstabs, and rolling attacks, which will all deal more damage and knock out more of the opponent's stamina, making it easier for you to knock them to the ground where you can execute a type of finisher move that will deal even more damage. There's also a kick ability tied to its own dedicated button, which you can use to temporarily dislodge an enemy's defenses, or if interspersed with regular attacks, to keep an enemy stunlocked longer than normal. The parry skill is particularly powerful if you get the hang of the enemy's attack animations and when to time it, since it'll knock them straight to the ground where you can execute that finisher attack and follow up with several more free attacks before they get up. It works on most enemies too, not just weapon-wielding humanoid opponents. If you can master the parry skill, it basically trivializes the difficulty. And while it might seem like a high-risk, high-reward type of situation, the risk actually isn't that bad, because there's a window where it will block all damage even if you don't get the exact timing right for a parry, so you don't get brutally punished if your timing is slightly off. 
Number 9. There are faster ways to raise or lower destruction than dialogue. Every now and then you may run into situations that require a certain destruction level to select a particular option in dialogue. This can sometimes force you into or out of a situation you might or might not have preferred if your destruction level doesn't match the intended options, in which case you may need to come back later or else reload a save and try again. The bulk of destruction shifts happen through dialogue options that you select when completing quests, and it can take a lot of these to change your destruction level sufficiently, which might not be possible if, say, you've already completed most of the available side quests and have limited opportunities to select more destruction options. However, you can quickly lower your destruction in large chunks by donating money to Theog and the Bastion, and you can quickly raise your destruction by attacking and killing random unnamed outlaws in the crater. Because the outlaws are a lawless society, there is no penalty for starting fights and killing people, other than the possibility of being killed yourself if too many people fight back. Number 10. Use the new UI features to your advantage. Helix 2 brings a lot of new functionality to the user interface that didn't exist in the first game, which can be of great use to you in your playthrough. For instance, there's a hidden auto-loot function where, if you keep holding down the action button when picking up an item, you'll continue picking up everything within your targeting range, which is a nice little quality of life improvement versus having to target and click on every single item individually. You can also mark items in your inventory as junk so that they can be sold all at once with the sell all junk button in a merchant window. Items marked as junk will remain marked as such, even if you sell everything of a certain type and then find more of it later, so this can be useful for tagging all those items in the other tab that serve no other purpose but to sell to vendors. You can also place a bunch of custom markers on the map to keep track of things you've seen but want to come back to later, or to cross off areas that you've already been to so that you have a better idea of where you have and have not been on the map. There's a decent variety of icons to choose from, and I believe you can place up to 100 before hitting the limit. The map screen also lets you highlight existing icons on the map to be tracked with your compass, which can be nice for tracking down the traveling merchants, and you can even track specific skill trainers, which is useful considering that skill trainers don't all teach the same types of skills anymore. Number 11. If you don't like the camera, use alternative options. The default camera has a dynamic zooming functionality where the FOV narrows and widens depending on your state of movement. For some people, this constant snap zoom effect can be enough to cause headaches, nausea, and eye strain, in which case the game can be borderline unplayable if not literally unplayable, while the low FOV can be pretty undesirable in general. Originally, that was your only way of playing the game, so that's what all the preview footage and early reviews showed, but they have since patched in an alternative camera which you can toggle in the options menu to eliminate the dynamic FOV zooming and keep it at a fixed angle and distance from your character. That's still not a perfect fix, however, because the camera still has an annoying tendency to drift from side to side and the fixed FOV may still not be to your liking. Those issues can be addressed with mods, however. One such mod gives you a good selection of FOV options to choose from, plus a few other options for how much mouth smoothing you'd like in the camera movement, or whether you'd like the camera centered or offset. Personally, I've found the mod to be the most comfortable way of playing the game, and would recommend finding your own desired configuration from the options available. Number 12. If you're having performance issues, try DX12 mode. Most people are probably going to run into some degree of performance issues with Elix 2, because the game doesn't seem to be optimized very well. My computer meets the recommended requirements, but it was basically impossible for me to get 60 frames per second while playing at 1440p and high graphics settings. While the game fared generally alright whenever I was out in the overworld, it was still apt to drop into the low 20s or even the high teens anytime I was in towns. As of right now, there is currently a beta build for DX12 testing available on Steam that you can opt into from the settings window, and many people report having significantly improved frame rates while using this beta build. In my experience, my frame rates improved by around 20 or 30 frames per second, which was enough to become at least acceptable in the more taxing locations. Note that this is still just a beta build, so it's not guaranteed to offer perfect performance. I for one have noticed an annoying tendency for the atmospheric lighting effects to lag out and get stuck on the old location when teleporting to a new location, the nighttime lights look subtly off to me, and for whatever reason the colors on the hacking terminals have become so washed out that it's hard for me to tell the difference between the white, yellow, green, and red indicators. I also started running into occasional crashes on startup, but this was always immediately fixed by just launching the game again. 
Depending on when you're watching this video, the DX12 mode may be in better shape and it may actually be officially implemented in the game as an option you can toggle from the settings menu. But for now, just be aware that it exists as an option you can try if you're struggling to get playable frame rates. Number 13. Drink all Elix and Stat Potions as soon as you find them. In previous Piranha Bytes games, it was recommended that you hold off on consuming permanent stat potions until later in the game, because the free points you would gain from the potion would count against your progression in terms of future costs to improve the stat. That is no longer the case in Elix 2. Attribute points that you gain from potions are tracked separately as bonus points and do not count against your attribute costs. Bonus attribute points will also count towards unlocking passive stat bonuses, although the progress meter doesn't reflect this accurately. You get a plus one increase to your various combat stats for every five attributes gained, regardless of where they come from. The meter will accurately represent your progress towards higher attribute point costs, but once you start using permanent potions it will no longer accurately track your progress towards bonus points. Likewise, Elix potions could be combined in the first game to create larger potions from smaller potions, so it was recommended that you not consume your small Elix potions to gain free experience, but instead use the crafting skill to turn them into medium Elix potions which would directly grant you free attribute points. Again, that is no longer the case. Since you cannot combine Elix potions into larger ones anymore, there is no benefit to holding on to your Elix potions to get more benefit out of them later. There is also no longer a karma penalty for using elix potions, since they don't count against your cold meter anymore, or in this case, your destruction meter. As such, you should feel free to use any and all permanent potions you come across as soon as you get them, since they provide entirely free benefits with no consequences or reduced efficiency versus using them later. Number 14. Pickpocketing and build weapons are the best way to earn money. Popular advice from the first game was to rush the Animal Trophies skill as soon as possible, because the earlier you got it, the more trophies you'd accrue over the game and thus the more money you'd earn in the long run. That was arguably the best way to earn money in that game, and while the same principle applies in Elix 2, it's actually much faster and more profitable to steal weapons from people in town and use the crafting skill to improve their condition, thereby increasing the overall sell value. Animal trophies sell for such a low value individually that you need to collect literally hundreds of them to sell for a few thousand elixir, when a single weapon stolen from someone in town might sell for that much and more. Sometimes a lot more. And since every NPC has a weapon you can steal, that means there's hundreds of thousands of shards to be earned, more than you could ever need, just by going around stealing from everyone in all five of the game's faction towns. The pickpocketing system seems to be based on a hidden percent chance of success, with certain NPCs and items having an apparent 0% success rate without a higher skill level. Level 1 pickpocketing is all you need to pick pockets, but you'll need to max the skill out if you want to steal all the best weaponry from the best NPCs. Note that there are a few equipable specialization items, which are basically like necklaces from Elix 1, that can grant you one free skill point in pickpocketing, so level 2 is the max you ever have to train. Because it's a percent chance, that means every attempt has at least some chance to fail, so if you want to get the most out of the pickpocketing system, you'll need to do a lot of save scumming to bypass those failed attempts. That can be pretty tedious at times, and might violate some of your own personal role-playing ideals, but the monetary rewards are worth it if you're willing to sit through it. The crafting system, meanwhile, is based on combining multiple weapons of the same type to create an improved version which usually sells for more than they're worth individually. A basic damaged weapon might sell for 100 elixir by itself, meaning you'd get 300 if you sold 3 of them, but if you combine them with the build weapon skill they'll actually sell for 450 elixir, a 50% increase in value. The actual sell values vary from weapon to weapon, so some are more or less profitable to combine, and some will actually sell for less value once combined, so just be observant of all the sell rates when doing this. This of course applies to all weapons in the game, not just ones you've stolen from NPCs, so it's generally a good idea to hold on to damaged weapons until you have three of a kind to upgrade and sell for a higher value. Note that upgrading beyond damaged or regular condition will require additional resources, so you probably don't want to bother upgrading to enhanced condition unless it's a weapon you're planning to actively use yourself. It's also worth mentioning that stealing weapons is sometimes the best, if not only way to get enough copies of the higher level weaponry to be able to craft the best versions of that weapon type. 
Not all enemies you fight in the game will use higher level weaponry, and they're pretty rare to find in stores, and when you do find one for sale, it's prohibitively expensive. So even if you don't want to mess with the pickpocketing for the sake of farming cash, it still might be worth it just for crafting your own gear from the weapons you can acquire. Crafting weapons, meanwhile, is the only way to get enhanced weaponry, so if you want to max out your character's stats, you'll eventually have to learn build weapons anyway. Number 15. Basically everything in the other tab can be sold. Much like in Elix 1, basically everything in your inventory that falls under the other tab can be sold for zero consequence. That goes especially for things designated as valuables, but there is not a single NPC who will ask you for 100 cigarettes or a dozen rolls of toilet paper to complete a quest. And unlike Elix 1, there is no apparent use for anything marked as raw materials, as you can no longer use some of those components for crafting outlaw ammunition, and none of the animal trophies that get sorted into this tab are used in any crafting recipes either. Some quest items will get sorted into this tab, but they're marked as being unable to sell to merchants, so you don't have to worry about accidentally selling them. There are a select few items you might want to hold on to, however, which I'll cover in the next section. Number 16. Some NPCs will buy select goods at a higher price. Astrid, the hunter outside the Berserker Fort, will buy leather and heavy leather from you at a higher price. Ivika, the mechanic in the Morcon Grotto, will buy servo motors from you at a higher price. Vivian, the storm master in the Cleric's Castle, will buy bread, canned goods, and water from you at a higher price. And Scrappy, the scrap foreman beneath the Berserker Fort, will buy iron ore from you at a higher price. Iron ore is used for crafting weapons and ammunition, so you probably don't want to sell that, and it's possible you might find a use for the foodstuffs for their healing properties, especially when used in cooking recipes, but leather and servo motors have no other use except to sell for cash, so you might want to hold on to those to sell to those specific NPCs. Number 17. Max out the chemistry and animal trophies abilities. As is typical advice for any Piranha Bytes game, the chemistry skill is worth learning for every build and playstyle because it will allow you to craft an essentially infinite amount of permanent stat potions. The purple stat potions each require 20 Dark Elix and a specific type of troll heart to make, and since enemies can respawn indefinitely, that means there's theoretically no limit to the amount of Dark Elix and troll hearts you can acquire. You don't need the Animal Trophy skill to harvest Troll Hearts or Dark Elix. You can do that completely untrained in Animal Trophies, but it's still worth it to max out the skill so you can harvest a natural Elix from mutants, some of whom won't drop Elix without it. This can likewise net you a theoretically infinite supply of Elix to brew a theoretically infinite amount of skill points and attribute points through Elix potions. Besides that, the extra animal trophies you earn can be sold to merchants for extra money, which is an added bonus on top of the Elix benefits, and the chemistry skill will allow you to make your own healing potions from plants, which can save you even more money in the long run. You won't have enough resources to make good use of this skill early on, so it's more of a mid to late game strategy, but it's definitely something you should be planning on building towards. Number 18. Some skills are broken or don't do what they say they do. If you're playing the game and taking it at its word, then you might use certain skills and just assume they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, when in fact, some secretly don't give the benefits they suggest. Some of these are easy enough to figure out through experience, but others are harder to notice without doing side-by-side -side comparative testing. If you're playing as a Morcon, for example, then you should be aware that the Rite of Combat, which claims to increase your attack speed, doesn't actually increase your attack speed. Your attack speed is practically identical whether the right is active or not, even when it's set to activate at its strongest value. If it's secretly doing something else, then I'm not sure what that is. Likewise, the Morcon right of stamina claims to increase your stamina, but it doesn't actually increase your maximum stamina. It does, however, increase your stamina regeneration rate, although the difference is somewhat negligible. If you're playing as a Berserker, a couple spells function a little differently than their descriptions imply. Mana Aura makes it sound like a constant AoE dot, with damage measured per second, but it functions more like a counter damage buff that only hits the opponent when you take damage. Similarly, the Mana Unleashed ability describes overcharging your shield to knock back enemies, but it too functions more like a reflect damage effect where you have to absorb damage into your shield and then release it back towards the enemy, seemingly doing more damage the more you absorbed. Then we've got the Outlaw Pick-Me-Up Chem, which claims to sacrifice HP to boost damage, but it does neither of those two things. 
Again, if it's secretly doing something else instead, I don't know what that is. Finally, the backstab skill explicitly states that it works on unalerted enemies, which makes it sound like a stealth ability, but you in fact gain no extra damage by using it on unalerted enemies. On the contrary, you only get the extra damage boost against alerted enemies who are in active combat mode. Note that it's possible I may have overlooked something else, and it's also possible that some of this may change with future patches. However, the game's been out for over four months and these issues still exist, so I'm not very confident they'll actually be fixed. I'll try to update the description or post a pinned comment if any addendums come up, but I can't make any promises. Basically, you should just be aware of these things and either understand how they work in advance, or be prepared to possibly have to test it yourself and verify if they're still broken or not. Number 19. Attribute point and ore prospecting skills aren't really worth it. There are a few skills in the game that benefit you more the earlier you get them. Namely, the ones that grant you an additional attribute point per level or extra ore per mined vein, but that also goes for the ones that grant additional experience, too. If you want to get the absolute most bang out of your character, then yes, you should probably learn these abilities early in the game. However, they're absolutely not required to max out your character. I never bothered learning any of them until the very end of the game and still wound up at level 65, having learned every single available skill and with all of my stats at 90+. The truth is, you don't really need the extra one attribute point per level when you can gain a theoretically infinite amount of attribute points and free stats with the chemistry skill, and there's likewise an infinite amount of experience to be gained in the game since enemies respawn indefinitely. So a meager boost to your experience isn't going to have much of an impact in the long run. As for the ore, there's plenty enough ore to be found in the world if you're thorough in exploration and are selective about what weapons you choose to upgrade that you shouldn't ever need the improved ore prospecting skill. Plus, if it turns out you're ever short on a certain type of ore, you can just buy more from merchants who have an infinite stock that replenishes every few days, and since there are an infinite number of respawning enemies, there's also an infinite amount of money to be spent buying an infinite amount of ore if necessary. These skills certainly aren't worthless by any means, but in my opinion there are better, more impactful ways to spend your limited skill points early in the game, and you really don't need their benefits to become overpowered by the end game anyway. Number 20. Check back on familiar characters and areas from time to time. Helix 2 has a lot of extra events that can trigger around towns as a result of completing or advancing quests, whether that be generic NPCs having casual conversations about what happened around town during your quest, or NPCs approaching you days later to follow up on a quest outcome after you completed it, or quest NPCs actually going to do the things they said they were going to do, and so on. If a character says, I need to talk to this other character about it, for example, they'll actually go to that character and have an actual conversation you can witness, in which case you can follow them to their destination or just stumble into the conversation randomly at a later time. It's a good idea, therefore, to periodically check around towns just to see what little changes or events are happening seemingly outside of your presence, since you can miss a lot of these fun details if you never return to certain areas or check back with certain characters after completing certain quests. And that's all I have for this beginner's guide to Elix 2. I'm sure there are plenty of other valuable tips and pieces of advice that I've forgotten or took for granted and didn't think to include in this video, so if anyone has other suggestions they'd like to add, feel free to mention them in the comments to provide extra assistance for new players seeking out this kind of advice. And if anyone has further questions, feel free to ask in the comments and I or someone else can hopefully answer them for you. 